What I want to talk about is how to ensure that aid actually reaches the people who live in settlements such as these. And I want to talk about some really remarkable people, grassroots leaders, grassroots organizations, that have shown us new ways of addressing problems like these. $125 billion a year goes through aid agencies and development banks to recipient governments. This is the headquarters of the World Bank that manages around a tenth of this. Yet, after 60 years of aid, one in seven in the world lives in informal settlements such as these, lacking water, lacking sanitation, lacking health care, lacking schools, lacking freedom from the fear of evictions, even lacking voice, because very often you need a legal address to be on the voters' register. We expect another billion people in settlements such as these unless we can change the way things happen. We estimate that less than 5% of aid goes to problems like these, and many aid agencies won't work in urban areas. Let's look a little bit closer. Instead of having the usual panorama of an informal settlement, here are the inhabitants of this settlement. Does aid ever reach them? Do they ever get consulted about how aid is spent? Are the consultations held in their language? Are the project documents that describe what is to be done in the language that they can understand? Here are some members of a savings group formed by homeless women in Harare. 300 of them formed a savings group. They negotiated a plot of land on which they could build houses for all of them. They needed $18,000 to pay the city government for putting in the roads and the water pipes. No aid agency would support them. Aid agencies and development banks were not set up to support groups like this. They were set up to support national governments. So I'm going to show you a horribly complicated picture of how aid works. You have the aid agency and all the decisions it makes. You have an internal structure, a lot of pressure to keep down staff costs. You have the money going to the recipient government, the government of Tanzania, the government of Uganda. You have the political process that oversees it, and you have all these pressures coming on the political process and the agency, the commercial pressures, the non-commercial development lobby, which I suppose I'm part of, the environment lobby, the media, public opinion. And of course, in the recipient government, you've got exactly the same competing pressures, the big commercial interests, the politicians, the civil servants. And finally, money gets to local government, usually weak, usually lacking capacity, and gets to contractors that constructs a project that maybe reaches the intended beneficiaries. This whole system is legitimated on the need of the people in that bottom right-hand corner. Yet, are any of the policy decisions ever accountable to them? Is any aid agency ever accountable to low-income groups? Sadly, no. I want to dream about another way Imagine that you're working in an aid agency, and you have the choice. You can manage 1,000 projects of $18,000, so 1,000 projects by homeless women wanting land on which to build their homes, or you manage one project, $18 million, a port, an airport, a dam. Of course, you choose the one project, because can you imagine how difficult it is to manage 1,000 projects at once? What if we did something very simple? The money went straight to a fund to which the urban poor organizations could apply direct. I want to talk about two examples of exactly this. I want to talk about the Urban Poor Fund International and the Asian Coalition for Community Action. These are funds that low-income groups can get direct, that are accountable to those low-income groups, and that are completely transparent in how all funding is actually spent. The first sign of what might call a new process was in 1977, when the first National Federation of Slum Dwellers was formed in India, shortly followed afterwards by Mahila Milan. Mahila Milan is, means women together. It's a federation of savings groups formed by women who live in slums or live on the pavements. And this is a mass movement. 
These have 750,000 savers in 65 cities. And these are champion toilet builders. Mihela Milan has built hundreds of community toilets and washing facilities, which they redesigned, they managed the construction of, and they manage today. Much better quality, permanently managed. Now there's 30 federations, 30 federations around the world, formed by slum dwellers, formed by shack dwellers, formed by homeless people. They're showing governments what they can do. Here is the Philippines, where they're discussing a house that the Philippines Homeless People Federation are going to build. Much cheaper than the government housing, much cheaper than the contractor housing, much better quality too. All of these federations in these 30 or more nations are also doing censuses of informal settlements. You can't improve an informal settlement if you don't have some sense of who lives there and where the streets are and where the infrastructure is. Governments can't do it. So these federations are doing their own mapping and their own censuses together. They're setting up their own funds where their savings go and from which they draw when they need project assistance. In 1996, six of these federations formed their own umbrella group, Slum Shack Dwellers International, to represent them internationally, to help them visit each other and learn from each other. This is one of hundreds of projects I could talk about. This is in Jinja. Um, when I was young, my hair was much redder, and I was called Jinja. So when I told the town clerk that my name was named after his city, he, he, he thought this was an excellent thing. <laughs> and this is a public toilet. For those of you that are worried about prices, it's about seven US cents to have a pee in this. <laughs> this is in the middle of a large informal settlement and an important informal market where there's no toilets. So you can imagine how important this is. But they also learned this clever trick from Mehila Milan in India. When you build a public toilet, you have to maintain it. So put a room above it, which you use for public functions. And of course, no one wants a public function in a smelly meeting room, so you keep the toilet very well managed. Here are representatives from the Federation, the Ugandan Homeless People's Federation, um, um, at a meeting I was recently at. And what amazes me about these federations is you get real accountability. On the wall of this meeting room, you've got these two, um, two posters clearly labeling who is responsible for the federation's work, lobbying, projects, finance, and very clear dis um, description of who is responsible for the community toilet, for its construction and for its management. And of course, all these federations visit each other, learn from each other. They have some influential friends. This is Prince Charles visiting Mumbai, visiting Dharavi, this enormous informal settlement. I hope I don't get done for treason, but the most influential person in this picture is actually the guy with the white shirt. This is Jokin Aportham, who founded the first national slum dweller federation who fought for 15 years to stop his settlement from being bulldozed, who realized that if slum dwellers are going to get change, they had to organize. But they also had to offer government credibility. They offered government partnership. They offered government their capacities. So when they work in partnership, so much more could be done. In 2001, we had an offer from a trust to provide some funding through my institute. Now, my institute isn't an aid agency. And how could we, my colleague Diana Mitlin and I, how could we choose who should get the funds? So chatting to the federations, the idea was we set up a fund to which the federations can bring projects, can draw funding, and can choose themselves, choose against competing um, projects, evaluating each other's projects. And to cut a long story short, with some continuous support, we got experience in running a fund. The women in Harare got their $18,000. They built their homes. In 2003, I was there, and it was announced that I'd provided them with the money. Well, I hadn't, but I had been part of, of, of the management system. They sang me songs of praise. If you've ever been sung songs of praise by Zimbabwean women, you know what harmony really means. I got five offers of marriage. <laughs> and they've allocated a plot for me to retire to. 
And this is the fantastic community um, hall that they built for all their meetings. 2006, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation got to hear about this. And to cut a long story short, they provided very generous funding, $15 million over these years, which enormously expanded this fund, hundreds of initiatives in many, many different countries. I want to talk about a second fund briefly too, known as ACCA, the Asian Coalition for Community Action. This gives small grants, $3,000 is the maximum grant. But as Sumsuk Bunia Bansha, the director of this program explained, this $3,000 is their dollars, and it's for them to choose. It's so rare for any funding to ever go to community organizations for them to choose. And they also supported big funds. This was $60,000. This is still not a big amount of money. And they supported citywide processes as government got sucked in to see what they were doing. Davao in the Philippines, after. Just in case you don't believe it, before, after. $750. $750 that the savings group is paying back so that one of their colleagues, one of their communities up further up the coast can also build this. Some truly awful housing, some really decent housing. Those, oh, that is the same place. You may find that hard to imagine. This fantastic all-weather road linking an informal settlement to the main city. The Women's Savings Group got under $1,100, but they leveraged so much else. They got materials cheap from the local government. They got a private donor to give them an extra 100 bucks. They got a shopkeeper to donate a bit of land. So money that comes from the outside stimulates them to find resources locally. In just five of the 18 nations where this program is going. Here are the dots. These aren't the dots of projects. These are the dots of cities where there's projects. In almost all these cities, five, six, or seven community initiatives have been supported, and they've sucked in local government. So in each of these places, you've got local government working with six, seven, eight community organizations, then imagining how to do what the community organizations were doing for the whole city. An awful lot of the settlements where this happened weren't on Google Earth, so this is a gross underestimation of the number of places this was happening. I think I'm running out of time. I could talk for hours about the fantastic community initiatives that I've visited, um, where I've learned. A surprise. Support for these funds from the Gates Foundation stopped. I don't think senior management at the foundation appreciated that they had funded one of the most amazing, innovative, bottom-up, poverty-reducing, empowering funds that's ever been. However, fortunately, some other funders are beginning to come on board. So if we go back to that slide that you've seen before, what this is doing is a lot more than that. The arrow means that the urban poor are creating the fund themselves. They're negotiating with local government. They're controlling local contractors, and they're even changing national policies. So where are we? We have an international poor fund that is serving over 30 nations, 30 federations in more than 30 nations, with its foundation of 16,000 savings groups, almost all managed by women, almost all led by women. Over 200,000 homes built or improved. More than 100 city authorities as partners. In the Asian Coalition for Community Action, nearly 1,000 community initiatives, 168 cities. 100 places where now there's funds jointly managed by local government and by the savings groups and their federations. Both of them moving from individual projects to getting the whole city engaged drawing in resources, combining resources, attracting new funders, the Rockefeller Foundation, Swedish aid agency, and the Norwegian aid agency, beginning to support these federations. What if just 1% of aid went to processes like this? It was about a billion dollars. How we would truly transform our cities. 
Sheila Patel, who's been advising this process for many years, made this beautiful statement. The most powerful resource of any poor community is being organized, bringing its own ideas, resources, and strategies to the table. Here are some um, web links where you can get more information. I also wondered whether I could borrow the acronym TEDx and suggest that it stands for Towards More Equal Development multiplied a thousandfold. Thank you for your help. <laughs>